The president wants to spy on 200 million Americans without a warrant. Has he read this document which he was sworn to uphold? Now, I will not have you libel Abraham Lincoln. I don't understand the problem with registering guns. We register cars. Mark Levine brings you the news the government doesn't want you to know. Today, an explosive story about connections between white supremacists and Islamic terrorists. When there's a conflict between Scalia's conservative values and the Constitution of the United States, he throws away the Constitution. When we do have secret prisons, that is not what America's all about. Let's go to Mark in five, four, three, two. Good evening, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. For gay and lesbian Americans, there's probably been no better time than the present. There are still achievements to be made. A don't ask, don't tell is expected to be repealed soon. And in state after state, increasingly, gay and lesbian couples can get married. There's certainly a way to go. But I think it's important sometimes to see where we've been, to note where progress has happened. And in that respect, I've invited really a legendary gay rights activist, someone I consider the founding father of gay civil rights, Frank Kameny. Frank Kameny was protesting for gay civil rights back in the 1950s, before the term gay even came into use, a decade before Stonewall. Today, it's his story. Frank Kameny, welcome to the Inside Scoop. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to have you here. Now, just to go through a little bit of your history here so that people understand where you've come from, uh, you're originally from New York City, yes. right? And uh, what I guess one of your earliest experiences was fighting in World War II. Uh, yes, I enlisted in the Army just before my 18th birthday in May of 1943, right at the height of the war, and served in frontline combat in Europe. Um, uh, in uh, 45, yes. I, I imagine that was a pretty scary thing. Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, when you're in combat and shells are coming down at you, you don't know whether you're going to be alive in a minute or two later. Yes, of course. That's what uh, uh, frontline combat is. And uh, would you say that way back in World War II, there were gay people in the military? Oh, yes, yes. And... Uh, well, including yourself, obviously. Yes. <laughs> and the... Uh, policy equivalent, not the statutory equivalent of uh, the military gay ban, what's called Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, existed back then as well. When I enlisted on May 18th, as I said, 1943, they asked. and why I didn't, What did they ask specifically? Uh, whether I had homosexual tendencies. Homosexual and, tendencies. And uh, um, things were very, very different then, but nevertheless, uh, as a... Uh, vigorous, healthy teenager. Um, there were things, in fact, to tell, and uh, I didn't. And I've resented for 67 years that I had to lie to my country in order to serve in a war effort that I strongly supported. So that was maybe the last time you had to lie on a form and say that uh, you weren't homosexual? Well, the last time I, uh, I flatly uh, lied, if you want to use that word, yes. Okay. Well, I, I can't blame you for that. <laughs> But tell me this, in, in the foxholes, uh, this time, as I recall, there were even segregated units for blacks and whites in World War II. So it wasn't just yeah, gay yeah, people oh, very, very much so, that yeah. were forbidden from fighting. Women, of course, were not fighting well, at yeah, that time. Exactly. Uh, and what, when you were growing up uh, in the 30s and the 40s, before we get to the heart of where your activism yeah. began in the 50s, what did people think of, I guess they called it homosexuality, they didn't use the term gay then. Uh, well... Within the gay community, as I learned later, the word gay uh, has been used for a very, very, very really? long time. But it didn't become known publicly and popularly and generally until approximately 1970. Okay, so during this time, uh, the American Psychological Association characterized homosexuality as a disease, a disorder. Uh, uh, yes, as an illness, and uh, later on, uh, uh, a couple of us started the fight. It took us 10 years. Uh, between roughly 1963 and 1973 uh, to turn them around. We'll get to that fight, I promise you. We're going to go through all, all right. these details tonight. But I, I guess what I'm trying to understand, right at the outset, right in the 40s when you're busy fighting for your life and for our yeah. country in World War II, what were your own personal feelings uh, about well, homosexuality? Well, at that point, of course, again, uh, the whole approach was very, very different. Now, I bought into, I was aware of feelings on my own part, and bought in to the common uh, attribution of those days that this was a stage that I was passing through and I was probably going through it a little bit more slowly than other people. <laughs> and uh, so on. I did 
uh, uh, date women, although it, you know, things never proceeded very far. And uh, did you think it was a sin? Were you worried about it religiously? I don't know what your religious uh, principles. I have I have turned myself a good pious atheist since approximately 1941. Okay, so even before, really, you uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, as far as I am concerned, um, uh, morality is. Uh, a matter of personal opinion and individual religious belief. I'm not going to let uh, people who lived 2,000 years ago do my thinking for, my, for me on anything, and, uh, and certainly not morality. And so sin, sin doesn't enter into my normal mode of thinking. Okay, but you were concerned that it was some kind of disorder, I guess, at that time. Well, I'm not concerned. I simply adopted the general attitudes uh, and precepts and concepts of the day. Yes, that homosexuality, a Freudian approaches, that sort of thing, uh, was a uh, disorder, or at least for younger people, a stage through which <coughs> males, at least, uh, tended to pass. So and I, I assume you kept it a secret for in the 40s and the 50s. Oh, yes, you? yes. Uh, there were some, a few contacts. I was not all that socially adept in general in those days. <laughs> uh, 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 quite aside from this narrow context itself, uh, but uh, no, uh, th as I said, there were a few contacts, one one good friend, and a, a few other people. Uh, one, later on, in, in, the, in the middle 40s, when I was in the military, I realized in retrospect there were quite a number of passes made toward me, <laughs> which I didn't recognize as such, and to this day I regret that I didn't know enough to follow up on them. Uh, is, is this a, a picture of you? Is this, uh, so we could show this up on the screen. Yes, uh, the, yes. Uh, this would be you in, in, the, uh, in the military. That's right. Okay. That's right. Uh, that, would have been, that would have been taken you know, very, very, very approximately, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, yeah, in the middle 40s, 40, okay. 44, 45, 46, early 46. So you came home after fighting for your country, risking you, your life uh, in 46, like so many people, uh, GIs, yeah. and that's when you started to work in the civil service? No, no. Uh, at that point, um, uh, I hadn't finished college yet. Oh, okay. So you went to college and, then. Uh, I had entered Queens College in New York City uh, uh, fairly young, at the age of 16 in 1941. And of course, I, there was, uh, I was out then for roughly three years in connection with the uh, military service, and uh, came back, went back to school in September of 46, and got my bachelor's degree in physics uh, mid-year, uh, January 48, and then went on to uh, graduate school uh, at Harvard in astronomy. Uh, and you were in you, mid uh, uh, mid academic year 48. And you worked for the United States government as an astronomer. After I got I got my uh, PhD finally in June of '56, and then came to Washington, was on the faculty at Georgetown University in the astronomy department for one year, and then in the summer of '57 uh, transferred over to what was then called it's changed its name twice since it was what was then called the Army Map Service. Okay, so here I mean you have an illustrious career, you're fighting for your country fighting in the military, you have a PhD, you have a doctorate, you're, you're a professor at Georgetown Astronomy, you're, you're doing quite well. Uh, and now you work for the Army Map Service, uh, serving your country, a professor, but uh, something happened at the Army yes, Map Service. Yes, well, basically, um, we, we have currently still the military, what I call the military gay ban, colloquially, don't ask, don't tell. In those days, in the 1950s, there was an equally stringent civil service gay ban, and large numbers of people uh, all through the 50s were fired or excluded from federal service simply because they were gay. Some of this happened during the Joe McCarthy era, is that, is that right? Th that was, was exactly the McCarthy era, yeah. yes. Did, and, was and that it, partly connected to the McCarthy era? A well, it was it? all part of the same mindset of that period. Back in approximately 1949, 1950, there were two Senate committees, uh, the Hoey Committee and the Huey Committee. The Senate Committee on Un-American Activities. Was Whatever one, they was, were. Well, that was one of them, I know. And uh, they simply gave instructions, in effect, to the civil service. 
that gay people were to be kept out. The Wherry Committee directed, uh, at that time we didn't have home rule in Washington as we have now, Congress was our legislature, uh, they directed the Metropolitan Police Department here to ferret out gay people, to report their names over to the Civil Service Commission uh, so that they could be fired or excluded. And that went on. A very large numbers of people, in that sense, were excluded from military service uh, uh, throughout uh, the 50s. And in fact, until I finally got the policy changed after 18 years of effort in 1973. Well, we're going to get to your policy changing, absolutely. Let me go back in the 50s, though. You were let go, you were fired from yes. the Army Mat Service, and they told you it's because you're a homosexual. They, uh, came, they came right out and said it. Uh, exactly, and uh, 52 years later, last June, they apologized to me for doing it. <laughs> a little, little late, I'm afraid. Well, I appealed at that time, and we all know the bureaucracy occasionally takes a while to mull things over. So this case and is 52 years. And they mulled over my appeal for 52 years. Fair enough. And, well, the civil service uh, is now called the OPM, the Office of Personnel Management. It's the same agency, really. And they gave me a very beautiful letter apologizing to me for the government's uh, action 52 years earlier. But they didn't give you back pay of 52 years, did I, they? I um, uh, humorously suggested to them that <laughs> I could very much use 52 years of back pay. Right. <laughs> they didn't offer you that. Well, let me ask you this. So, so they come out and they say to you, your boss, I guess, is your, who, who comes and says to you, uh, Frank, we, we hear you're a homosexual. Uh, how, how does it happen? Uh, the, I, was, uh, I had been out on a uh, tour uh, for the agency. Uh, we had some uh, facilities out on the uh, in Texas and California, and spent a month in Hawaii, uh, all in connection with the map services operation. When I came back, some uh, civil service investigators called me in and said, we have information that leads us to believe that you are homosexual. Do you have any comment? And I said, what's your information? And they said, we can't tell you. Oh. And I said, well, then I can't give you an answer. And in any case, um, it, it's utterly irrelevant, so I'm not going to answer. And uh, then the bureaucracy proceeded from there, and I was fired uh, at the very end of 57, beginning okay. of 58. Okay, why don't you stop right there, because we have to take a commercial break. I want to encourage, though, anyone who has a question or comment for Frank Kameny to please call in. All you have to do is pick up the phone, dial toll-free, 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. We're going to go through the chronology of his life, but there should be plenty of time for questions at the end. You can also comment in the chat room. Just go to RadioInsidesGroup.com, and we'll ask some comments on the air. We'll be right back with the founding father of the gay civil rights movement after this. I want all the medical treatment available to me. I wouldn't want my family to have to make this decision. My doctor knows what's best for me. An advanced directive is your life on your terms. Talk with your family. Decide what's right for you. Then put it in writing. Documenting my wishes today means my family won't have to make heart-wrenching decisions later. To learn more, visit www.putitinwriting.org. 1,200 American youth run away from their homes every day. The National Runaway Switchboard is here to help. 1-800-RUNAWAY. If you are a runaway, thinking about running away from home, or a parent or guardian concerned about issues facing your child, call us 24 hours a day. 1-800-RUNAWAY. In times of crisis, hope is just a phone call away. 1-800-RUNAWAY.
Here again, The Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to The Inside Scoop. I'm here with a founding father, really, of the gay civil rights movement, uh, someone who's been active since the 1950s. Recently, he was, uh, he's been honored several times, in fact, by President Obama. We'll get to the recent stuff. But first, I'm focusing really on Frank Kameny's life story, how he came to be, quite accidentally, I think, yeah. at first, a gay civil rights hero. Frank, so you, you, you got a doctorate, you're an astronomer, you're a professor at Georgetown, and they come in in 1957 and say, we have reason to believe that you're homosexual. And you said, what's your information? They said, we're not going to tell you. And he said, well, then I'm not going to yeah, tell you anything. Yeah, so that, but, but they do let you go. Uh, yes. And in fact, one of the things I was reading, and correct me if I'm wrong, they asked you to name other people to no, figure your friends. No, oh, that, no. Said, that was in, later. In general, in general, the practice, for example, there was this whole police context that I referred to a mm -hmm. few minutes ago, and they always asked people uh, for names of others so that the whole list could be fed into the civil service so people could be fired. They did not ask me specifically for names of others. Okay, people. so that common practice actually did not happen to you. To me personally. Okay. Now, you, at that time, were you aware of the earlier civil rights movement, Harry Hay, the Mattachinian Society that began in, in, in 1951? A, in a general sense, yes. Uh, Harry Hay had... Uh, founded what then became the modern, with continuity, the modern uh, gay movement in uh, Los Angeles in 1951. I was aware of that. A, a, a few organizations grew out of that by the time uh, I became involved in things in the very late 50s and early 60s. There were maybe five or six, that's all. In the whole gay, country. Gay organizations in the whole country. It was a very small movement. And, uh, and at that time, when you were fired, you had no association with the gay rights movement, did you? I, right after I was fired, I contacted them. And so there was some communication back and forth. Uh, one of the groups in California, uh, I remember, sent me uh, $50 to help me out. In those days, $50 was a lot more than it is now. And so it was meaningful. Um, but uh, beyond that, uh, not all that much. But uh, I, I don't uh, run away from things. I fight back. And, and, and in fact, you took this case all the way up to the United States I Supreme Court. I proceeded to appeal with the aid uh, of the, uh, initially, of the American Civil Liberties Union. ACLU was helping you way back then? Uh, yes. And uh, they, they, they took it, and, and of course, I appealed administratively all the way up to the White House and to the House and Senate uh, Civil Service uh, Committees. And uh, the ACLU, their attorney, uh, took it through the first two stages, the district court and the court of appeals. And it was quite clear, we lost in both, and it was quite clear that it wasn't going to be uh, terribly successful, or so he thought, at the Supreme Court. So, uh, but I don't let things go. You can write your own brief for the court. So I wrote, uh, he gave me some instructions and guidelines for writing petitions, um, and uh, uh, I proceeded to write my own uh, petition uh, for the Supreme Court. With no uh, lawyer with, whatsoever? No. And of and, course, you don't have legal training. Uh, no, uh, that was the start of um, uh, a self-designated career as a paralegal. I see. And, and of course... But you couldn't find a single lawyer yeah, in the country yeah, to help no, you. The court is up there. And their public servants are afraid to take literally. So if I had any questions, and I did have some, I called up the Supreme Court and said, what do I do now? Uh -huh. And got instructions from them. And I filed my petition uh, in January uh, 1961. To the best of my knowledge and belief, that was the first gay rights brief, legal brief, ever filed anywhere by anyone. And I must say, after half a century, I read it just the other day. I have a copy of it at home still. And I must say, it reads pretty well. Okay, it's not in the <laughs> Smithsonian, because they took a bunch of your papers, didn't uh, they? Uh, they have a copy of it there. They have a yeah, copy of yeah, your brief uh, in the Smithsonian. Or the Library of Congress, Library of Congress one Congress. or both, yes. Okay. Yes. Now, around this time, you start, when you lose before the U.S. Supreme Court, and you do lose, they don't hear your case. Uh, they chose, uh, uh, and the one bit of publicity that the case got at that time, yes, uh, in those days, all Supreme Court decisions came out on Mondays. And mo it was a Monday late in March, give or take, March 20th, March 25th, thereabouts. What year? 
1961, okay. uh, uh, they issued decisions or uh, decisions not to accept right. a serious case. And the then Washington Star, which doesn't exist anymore, uh, that Tuesday had a whole series of little one inch by one inch by one inch news items. And you were in that. And, and, and uh, uh, I was in that. Yes. Now, now, you're out of a job now for four years. Uh, what are was, you doing? It was very difficult. Uh, there was a uh, period of about eight months in the late 1959 when I was living on uh, 20 cents worth of food a day. And again, 20 cents is a lot more than now, but even so. Uh, because no one will hire you because uh, of this state? Uh, 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 I hadn't been in astronomy professionally when I was fired. It wasn't that long after my PhD, so I hadn't had a chance you had no tenure. To, to set up uh, to acquire a professional reputation through accomplishment inside my profession. So Georgetown fired you too. It wasn't just no, 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 no. no that no. was a voluntary uh, transfer over. Okay. And uh, uh, then I uh, uh, so that uh, now my background was in uh, uh, phys uh, uh, the non-astronomical background was in physics, optics. I got um, starting in uh, September '59. I got a series of jobs with companies here um, uh, in Washington. However, uh, there was in uh, existence at that time a 1953 Eisenhower executive order, executive order 10450, came out around April 23rd, 1953, which uh, excluded gay people from receipt of security clearances. So I could get jobs only in companies where there was no security clearance required. They were all second and third rate companies which went out from under me. There were three or four of them throughout the early part of the 60s through to about 68. And, and your but training at least they was gave in, me some income. Your training would be in the kind of military issues where you would need a security uh, clearance. Uh, uh, if, uh, uh, it would have been usable in that kind of context if I could have gotten the security clearance. Okay. Yes. Meanwhile, so you've been outed, as it were, against your yeah. will. Um, what do you start doing personally? And, and what was the right, gay well, scene like in the late 50s? Well, right. Again, in those days, everything was covert. Uh, I mean, the, the gay movement, which we referred to a few minutes ago, um, they didn't quite suit my personality. And this is not a criticism of them, it was a different era culturally, but they were apologetic, defensive, they gave a great deal of weight to the so-called experts and authorities, which I didn't accept. And you were never apologetic no. or defensive? No. And so, um, my, so I felt that here was a situation where... These were the Booker T. Washingtons yeah. of the gay rights <laughs> Where world. something needed to be done. So in the course of 1961, in conjunction, the uh, national... Um, um, the Madison, which was uh, Harry Hayes. By the way, where does Madison oh, come from? The Madison in the Middle Ages were a group of court jesters okay. who wore masks and costumes. I see. And from behind the masks and costumes were permitted to make pointed personal and social commentary. I see. Uh, was forbidden was forbidden to other people, and that was very much pre First Amendment days. So the idea, uh, the concept of Truth from in hiding, or truth from behind a mask, seemed very appropriate. That was adopted then. When I founded the Madison in Washington as an independent group in 61, I wanted a much more explicit name. But at that point, I was a step or two ahead of the troops, so to speak. The name, word Madison was in the air, and so uh, uh, over my objections, that was the name of the organization, and off we went. Tell me, because I think people, uh, there's still, of course, some furtive of this today, but particularly in 1960, how did gay people socialize? Were they afraid? And, Were the, the they, police no, going to come into bars? They're, and they're, like well, you have to, uh, two separate um, parts of the answer to that. Uh, first of all, you have to keep in mind that up until um, uh, quite a bit later, in those days, in every state, there were anti-sodomy laws which referred to oral sex, among other things, which 93% uh, of all adults, not just gay adults, engage in, but, there was, but it was felonious in every state. The first state to repeal was Illinois at the end of 61. 
uh, and the police would go out and... Uh, by the way, I've always found it fascinating. Justice Scalia refuses to answer the question of whether he's committed sodomy, even though he upheld a 20-year sentence for oral sex yes. uh, that included uh, you know, a man and a woman. So it, it's very uh, strange. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, so uh, uh, keep in mind that solicitation or invitation for a felony is a crime in itself. Uh, in Virginia, it was, a fe- it was an actual felony in itself. In other states, it's a misdemeanor. So the police would go into the gay establishments such as they existed at that time, and uh, in a quasi-social kind of thing, get people pr- to propose uh, uh, doing sex. things, having sex, at which point there would be an arrest, and then here in Washington, into the Civil Service Commission went the name. Great. And so the police would go into bars and restaurants that gay people were known to yes. go to. Uh, so how did you know who was gay and who was a cop? Uh, you had to. You, in those days, you took your chances. And now, in some some uh, jurisdictions, New York for one, uh, Virginia for another. There were were others. I don't I have a, a, a list at all going back all those days. Uh, it was actually illegal for gay people to congregate or assemble in a really? bar. Uh, my constitution says you have a right of assembly. Is this just... Uh, well, uh, ultimately... Uh, right of the people peaceably to assemble. First Amendment. They just ignored this. Well, if you, if, if you were gay, you couldn't. Not in a bar. Not in a bar. In other places, perhaps, but not in a bar. And, uh, uh, and bars could not, as such, knowingly, in those two jurisdictions and others, could not knowingly serve gay people. Okay. So and uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we didn't get that turned around in Virginia until the 1990s. And uh, at least as at least as as a legal technicality. And uh, so I'll tell you what, we're about to take a break. All right. uh, but when we come back, I want to move from the 50s to the 60s. The 60s right. is, of course, the classic era of uh, freedom, of civil rights, but, of free love, and that's of we got all that kind of stuff. And uh, I want to find out how that culture helped infect the gay rights All right, movement. Fair and find out. Also, I want to encourage people to call in, to write in, to join in the chat room, or you can just listen in. That's fine too. The toll free number is 888 488 Mark, 888 488 6275. And Frank Cavity has a long, fascinating history. We're going to get as much of it done as we can. We'll be <laughs> right back after this. Too many women get hit by their boyfriends and husbands. Too many women are pressured into having unprotected sex. Half of the people in the world living with AIDS are women. It doesn't have to be this way. Together, we can change this reality. Let's strive for a world free of violence. At Volunteers of America, we don't just give kids a way to stay off the streets. We give them the tools they need to reach their full potential. We don't just help the elderly receive needed care. We help them live life to the fullest. We don't just provide food for homeless individuals and families. We provide job training and placements so they can buy groceries. Volunteers of America is a national organization that for over a hundred years has provided programs and services that allow people to overcome their challenges to become vital members of their community. At Volunteers of America, we don't just help people, we help people help themselves. Find out how you can support the programs that are working in your community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899-0089. Drivers face all kinds of distractions. Before your wireless phone becomes one of them, stop. Drive safely. Keep your phone in easy reach and dial sensibly. In bad weather or traffic, call later and use a hands-free device. Remember, with wireless, safety is your call.
Here again, The Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to The Inside Scoop. It's my privilege and honor to be here with the legendary, uh, one of the founding fathers of gay civil rights, Frank Kameny, uh, to talk about his life story. And uh, we're trying to get as much accomplished. We're actually going to skip the last break so that we can plow on through because there's a lot of very interesting stories to tell. Okay, Frank, we've got the 50s covered. We're now moving into the 60s. Yeah. And of course, the 60s is famous for uh, peace and love and uh, mm -hmm. all that good yeah. stuff. Well, How did that affect you? For, for us, um, uh, when we got going in 61, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, there were only five or six gay organizations in the country. Mm -hmm. So unlike now, when, as you might expect, with a large mature movement, you have specialized groups. In those days, we had to do everything. So we had the psychiatrist telling us we were sick. Obviously, we were not gonna, uh, society was not going to give uh, equality to a bunch of loonies. So we had to examine that. Uh, we had the civil service disqualifying us. We had the police arresting us. We had the religious uh, uh, fundamentalists calling us sinners. There was not anything at all affirmative. The ACLU was affirmative. You gave me one example. Yes, but uh, even there, uh, they were still coming to terms with the whole question that early. The ACLU, the law, uh, there was a Washington office of the ACLU in 61. But the uh, local affiliate of the ACLU wasn't founded uh, until the end of 1961, December, uh, November 8th, one week before I founded Madison. Okay. And one of the things you started to do in 1965 is you start to picket the White House. Well, and the thing... Uh, we have a photo of you, I think, is, I don't, this isn't in front of the White House. This may be later on. Yeah. 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 The, uh, the 60s, classically, didn't have a sharp beginning and a sharp ending. Things were sort of building up, uh, spurred on by the intensely unpopular Vietnam War. Sure. And so the, the level of activism uh, and, and expression of dissent um, uh, increased all through the 60s and certainly on into the 70s. But, but let me ask you this. You, you, you decide, you have a Democratic president, Lyndon Johnson, and you decide to get a group of, what, 10, 20 people well, what and, happened and march well, to, in a well, circle? Again, let, let me explain. Yep. Uh, all right. At that point, we were, we were speaking of 1965 mm -hmm. now, uh, uh, the kind of a more extreme uh, violence and rioting and so on, which became much more commonplace in the late 60s, still hadn't gone on, so that um, something like picketing was the a, a prime expression of dissent, so that some days you would get as many as a dozen separate groups picketing each in its own ellipse in front of the White House, uh -huh. all across the front and down the sides of what were then streets that closed off now, the East and West Executive Drive. And uh, uh, well, we, let me ask you this: Were people afraid to picket with you because they no, might lose their jobs? No. Uh, well, y yes and no. Uh, uh, some of them, yes. Uh, we, we uh, everybody in the local Washington matter scene, simply in order to uh, uh, protect them on that, were re except me, uh, except me alone, were required to use pseudonyms. And uh, there were about ten people or so. We purposely didn't announce our demonstration in advance because we didn't want to give the bureaucracy a chance to dig up some regulation or another to prevent us from picketing. So uh, This is actually, uh, I have a picket. Uh, that, that's a reenactment. Oh, that's a reenactment. Very recently oh, okay. by a, a group of, a class from the University, I think it's Wisconsin, who came to Washington, dug out a record of all the signs we carried, uh -huh. made copies of those signs, and then I and one other person. Um, wait a minute. Maybe that goes. Maybe I can't quite see. Well, let me ask you. Let me ask you about this because one of the things that is interesting in this photo and in your White House pickets is that you always wore a suit. You didn't pick it in in in. No, uh, maybe that is an actual picture. I think about that about picketing. Yes. And and but but why did you decide to dress up? Wear a suit? Again, you have to keep in mind. Um, everything was much more conservative in those days. Um, all men's uh, shirts were white, period. Mm -hmm. Blue? No. Right. Blue? No. Okay. Other colors? No. White shirts. 
And uh, but so for people to take so you seriously, our, our you had to. Our argument was we were seeking uh, non-discrimination in employment, in in terms of the general attitudes of the day. We wanted to look employable, and that meant wearing uh, skirts for the women, suits for the men. Now that by the late 60s, uh, 68, 69, we had very much softened that. Right, that's this picture tempered. I have right here. Yes. You, uh, yes, we no, have no longer wearing yes, a suit. We least. have very much tempered that. But in the uh, early 60s, that was very much par for a very different era in those respects from the fact we're going back half a century. It's now, insane. Now, you coined the phrase gay is good? Uh, yeah. What happened there was, as I indicated earlier, we had nothing but negativism coming at us from every possible direction uh, in, in that whole period. Well, in, 19, six, in June of 1968, I saw a television piece of Stokely Carmichael uh, leading a group of students out in, I think it was Salisbury, Maryland, chanting, black is beautiful, mm -hmm. and realized that the psychodynamics there were identical for us. Black is, whatever the context is, whatever the subject is, black is always a negative thing. And so black is beautiful was a direct head-on psychological counter to that. And I realized we needed exactly the same thing. I toyed around with slogans and phrases and language. Obviously, homosexuality for a slogan is a bit clinical. It's, it's not uh, a bit clunky, too. Probably. On the <laughs> other hand, gay at that point was not commonplace in usage, not for another couple of years. But eventually, yeah. I settled on gay is good. And if, after I'm gone, I, re I am remembered for absolutely nothing else, I want to be remembered for having coined that slogan, gay is good. Fair enough. So I coined it in, in, in July. At that time, by then, we did have a nationally based gay organization, NACO in brief, the North American Conference of Homophile Organizations. And, and they had a meeting in Chicago uh, in August uh, of, um, 70, of 68. And I put it forward then. It was adopted by them and has proceeded. Let me ask that. you this, because I, I think you, <coughs> you, you wore the suits. You were definitely believed in protesting and doing everything in, in, in a lawful manner. Uh, there was a group, and I think in the 60s, called the Gay Liberation Front. No, that came... Oh, that's the 70s. No, that, that, that came in... That was short-lived. That came in uh, right after the Stonewall okay. riot. Well, then let's talk about and Stonewall. And they were formed uh, in the uh, midsummer of 1969, they were gone by All around right. 1972. The radical uh, game. Yes. Okay. Yes. But let me ask you about Stonewall. So, of course, Stonewall is a bar in New York City. The police yes. raid it. The gay people uh, refuse to. Well, some are arrested, but many of them fight back and refuse uh, to be. Yes. And, and what was what you were he here in Washington D.C. You weren't there. Yeah. What did you hear about Stonewall? What did you think about it when yeah. you first well, heard about it? Well, I was in touch, of course. Again, keep in mind we were dealing with a very tiny gay, gay movement in those days. I was in close touch with um, uh, the Madison of New York, which at that point was the only gay group in New York, and uh, 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 heard about it from them, and of course it got into the news. And uh, Did you think they went too far, fighting with the police? Oh, no, 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 uh, I, I saw that as something which had been simmering and festering and was on its way for a very, very long time. Did you think it would become a symbol the way it has no, today? No, no, I didn't at that point. And, uh, but uh, the police in New York, particularly the police, had been raiding gay uh, bars where gay, gay people assembled. I had alluded, I alluded to that a while ago, that kind of syndrome. And uh, so, uh, no, I was very glad to see it. And uh, obviously, I didn't know where it would go at that point. But we watched it with very, very great interest. The Gay Liberation Front uh, was formed. Uh, very shortly thereafter, and then uh, six months or so later on, toward the end of the year, in sort of a reaction to the over-inclusiveness and lack of structure of the Gay Liberation Front, the New York City Gay Activist Alliance was formed, and for the next couple of years, they were at the forefront of gay activism. Now, now when did you decide to take on the American Psychological Association? Oh, 
Uh, all right. Uh, I mentioned uh, we got going, as I said, in 61. And uh, we very quickly, uh, we were aware of what the psychiatrists were saying. And to repeat myself of a few minutes ago, uh, our effort, the gay agenda, um, still to this day can be subsumed under a single word of equi- uh, single word equality. And uh, we were very well aware that if uh, we were a bunch of loonies, which is what the psychiatrists were calling us, we were not going to get equality. So I had to look into it. I didn't know what I was going to find. I'm a scientist by training and background. I know good science when I see it. I know bad science when I see it. I didn't know what I was going to find. If they were justified, then we would have to make the best of a bad, best of a bad deal. Uh, what I found was that was absolutely appalling. Shabby, shoddy, slipshod, sleazy, pseudoscience, masquerading as science, um, a, a, abominable pa- sampling techniques. The only people who went to the psychiatrist were, were gay people who had problems. Why should a happy gay person go to a psychiatrist? So they, ne- they never saw the other side. So we looked at it very carefully, and in about 1963, very roughly, we issued a statement, which I wrote, saying, and the opening clause is the important thing, in the lack of of valid evidence to the contrary, I repeat, in the lack of valid evidence to the contrary, homosexuality cannot be considered a sickness, illness, disturbance, or disorder, but must be considered a preference, orientation, or propensity, not different in kind from heterosexuality. That's a verbatim quote from memory. And the, what that did functionally and structurally was to shift the burden of proof. If there, if there was valid evidence to the contrary, I'll repeat that opening statement, let the sickness people bring it forward. And in the next 10 years, they never did. By invitation, I was present at the headquarters of the American Psychiatric Association on December 15, 19. 19- 73. This, by the way, is a picture of you in 1972. Uh, you're testifying at the American Psychological Association. Yeah. I I'm the middle one. You're the middle one. <laughs> you're not the guy in the mask, and you're not the woman. Uh, and uh, who's the guy in the mask, and why is he wearing That's a mask? Him. That was Dr. John Fryer. He's now gone. Uh, in those days, um, it was uh, he was a, a professional psychiatrist. In those days, it was professional suicide for a psychiatrist to say that he was gay. And th- that was a panel discussion at the American Psychiatric Meeting uh, in May 1972. And uh, uh, now later on, things change very much. There's now an active uh, gay and lesbian uh, caucus in the APA, but that what was What do you then. think was essential in persuading the psychiatrist to take homosexuality off the disease. Well, right, let me finish the, the sure, other go story. Right go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So in any case, as I said, by invitation, I was present at the APA headquarters uh, in, on December 15, 1973, when they issued their mass cure. And uh, <laughs> uh, three of the other side came in and presented papers, which I later saw. Right up to the end, they still were not presenting the valid evidence of the country. Scientific they never, evidence. Scientific evidence. They just simply never did because it's not there. And uh, so uh, we conti- we pushed uh, all the way through. Things really got going when uh, um, a lot of other people, not, uh, I don't want to take sole credit for something for which a lot of people deserve credit. Uh, we started pushing, uh, and, and particularly up in New York and um, after some war in 70, 69, 70, 71, uh, at the meeting in the uh, the May meeting uh, of the APA in 1971 was here in Washington, and uh, there uh, uh, I was invited to conduct a uh, panel on non-patient uh, homosexual stories. I was in their convention uh, by invitation, and uh, some of our groups had planned an invasion, and uh, I seized the microphone. And we were pushing hard, and saying, uh, I'm summarizing a great deal here. And uh, in 72, um, it was there in Dallas. In 73, it was in uh, Honolulu at Waikiki, Waikiki, and they really got the discussion going. 
and by the late 73, uh, the, the issue had been joined, we had been cured, and things proceeded from there. Now, around this time, actually, a little bit before the actual uh, removal of uh, from the from the uh, diagnostic statistic yeah. manual from uh, the disease list, uh, you actually run for Congress. I have here a poster, March 23rd, a vote for Kameny is a vote for personal freedom. Yes. Kameny Committee for Congress uh, in March 71. You live in the District of Columbia. They don't have representation uh, in Congress, uh, right? Let me, uh, for, for those people who may see this who don't live in, in the Washington area, uh, we now have, with certain galling limitations, since 1975, we have home rule here right, in Washington. Right, right. But prior to that, Congress was our legislature. Right. So how were you running for and, All right. Uh, however, home, the home rule that was uh, such as it is, which was finally achieved in 1975, came in in steps, starting in the 60s. We got an elected school board in I think 1969, and in 19 at the end of 1970, too late for the normal November congressional elections in 1970. Congress gave us what we still have, a non-voting non member. Eleanor yes. Holmes Norton fulfills that role now. today. Yes, exactly. So you ran for her job. And so I ran before her, yes. And so th there were primaries in January, and then some people approached me and, and suggested that I run as an independent candidate. Now, of course, you were openly gay. Uh, yes. Are you the first openly gay person to run for Congress? Uh, to my, uh, to, uh, yes. And to the best of my knowledge, I'm the second openly gay person to have ever run for any public office as of that date. Who's the first? Uh, someone who ran for Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. I'm miserable on names. That's okay. And I apologize. It wasn't Harvey Milk, was it? No, no, no. no, no. Long before it, him. it was in 1961 that he ran. Interesting. So in any case, uh, in, nowadays, of course, uh, the normal nomination procedure nominating petitions float, everybody knows about them. In 61, nobody did. And we had a great deal of trouble getting nominated. We needed 5,000 signatures. I have a picture of you with a Kameny button yes. in 1971. So, so I said, fine, so you get the signatures and I will run. So they did, and I did. Was and, it close at all? Uh, I came in fourth out of six candidates. All right. You were, you were, oh, you yes. were the ultimate last. And what Let it, me what, ask you this. What that did was to establish us as a political force here in the District of Columbia. The then formative uh, Reform Democrats, which were really getting going with the slow onset of home rule, uh, called us in and began to work with us. And we have put that to very, very, very good use in the 40 years since. Well, it's interesting because just a few years later, about five years later, you took an action in the District of Columbia that actually had residents today. In 1977, you worked on the D.C. Human Rights Act, uh, the, the part of D.C. law that says you can't discriminate uh, on any basis. Well, that, 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 that was, you got your dates wrong. Oh, 79. No. That was, uh, the very first uh, gay-related anti-discrimination law in the country went into effect in East Lansing, Michigan, okay. in either 1971 or 1972. That was a one-liner. Okay. Uh, you had nothing to do with that? No, okay. no nothing whatever. Uh, but um, the idea of anti-discrimination laws was beginning to emerge in many places in the country, and people got together here. At that point, again going back to the slow emergence of home rule, we had a, an appointed city council at that stage. The elected city council, the president that I referred to, didn't happen until 1965, to repeat myself. But we had a and they and their staff got going on what is one, even after all this time, one of the most, the finest anti-discrimination laws in the country. The District of Columbia Human Rights yeah, Act. Yeah, human rights law. And, and uh, you were instrumental I was in making sure that sexual orientation in was that included? They included sexual orientation. Now, let me give a little bit of an anecdote. A few years before that, I had been talking to people at the Civil Service Commission. And they said, this is paraphrased now, but they said, oh, of course we don't discriminate against gay people. We only d uh, exclude people who engage in those dreadful homosexual acts. <laughs> so I, I passed that on, the, the, the substance of it, the concept, to the people drafting the uh, uh, D.C. gay rights law. And they 
um, they work that into the language um, so that it prohibits discrimination on the basis of homosexuality, heterosexuality, and bisexuality by preference and by practice. And I accept, I, I approve and what's of that language, to me and that is still in the law. Is that the work that you did in the 1970s? I cited myself personally in helping uh, to prevent a referendum on the issue because. Oh, yeah, uh, that came later on. Later on, yeah. uh, it's, it's 79, the DC Council says you can have a referendum on any issue except on the budget. Yeah. Or if it discriminates, exactly, and you were instrumental in yeah, uh, yeah. in that that yeah. part too. Yeah. Well, coming back to finish the other thing, yeah. you, you mentioned seventy-seven a few minutes ago. After we got full home rule to repeat for the third time or the fourth in nineteen seventy-five, uh, they they felt it was necessary to reenact the human rights law as a statute instead of just an, a regulation as the earlier enactment had been. So they reenacted, unchanged, the whole Human Rights Act in 1977, and it is still there. And, if, and right. in fact, it was cited recently in order to protect yeah. gay people's right to marry. Yeah. I'll tell you, we, we only got about six minutes left, and there's so much of your history. Let, let me fast forward real rushing all, all, right. all, all the way up and ask you, looking over the course of your life, what do you think is your most, you said you, maybe the gay is good is your most important contribution? If, did, did, if only one thing is singled out, yes. What do you think you have to tell people today who are still, still fights? Don't ask, don't tell. It's still law. Uh, you can still legally fire someone for being gay. We don't have the employment. Yes, and Doman is a so called defense. We, we of still, uh, yes. gay people can only get married in some five or six states. Yes. What advice do you have from your very long history of activism? to give to activists who are still fighting the battles today? All right. First of all, deep down in your own psyche, you always have to keep in mind that in dealing with those who oppose us, we are right, they are wrong, end of discussion, at least at the outset. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, always uh, express yourself, use, use affirmative rhetoric. In other words, the slogan I coined was not, gay is not bad. It was gay is good. Uh, 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 Same-sex marriage does not endanger marriage. It enhances marriage. Always rhetorically take that next step to the affirmative, not merely non-negative thinking and rhetoric. And beyond that, uh, uh, simply uh, um, deal realistically and firmly and uncompromisingly um, with the uh, uh, structure around you. Ultimately, these things always boil down to practical politics. Um, uh, get to know uh, the politics that you're dealing with um, and follow them up. Uh, uh, you uh, don't have any hesitation in calling in uh, allies and so on. But uh, don't, uh, in the end, you you stick with your or issue. If you try, the, the thing that the gay liberation from the early 70s went wrong on, if you try to do everything, you end up doing nothing very well. So stick with our issues. Um, but join create, coalitions. Co create coalitions and alliances and uh, 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 operate on a vigorous, active basis. Now, Bill Clinton got rid of the, the, the gay ban on security clearances and on the civil service, right? Funny, yeah, now that was a long fight. Way in the start, 90s. I started that in 67. And so that one took 30 I, years. I was the authority in the country for years on security clearances for gay people. I handled more, more cases as a paralegal than I can count, yes. Okay, and there were sodomy laws, and those were... Eventually, not to Lawrence v. Texas in 2003. Yeah. Uh, those but you worked on repealing those in D.C., right? Uh, it took me, that was a 30 year, it took me 30 years, uh, just over 30 years to get the D.C. one repealed. And I had the privilege, through the council member involved, of actually drafting the text of the repealer. So it took you 30 years to repeal the sodomy laws, 30 years to repeal the civil service clearance. There are a number of gay people that are quite upset that President Obama hasn't gotten rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell and put in the Employment Non-Discrimination Act and got rid of marriage discrimination in its first 15 months. Yeah, well, and yes, and I feel... What's your feeling about President Obama? Is he too slow? No, no, no. Uh, no, I feel that on most of... The, I feel 